Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we begin our last section of parasitic diseases, the trematodes. Today we'll discuss their classification and a little bit about their biology, but actually, as we work our way through the major uh, trematode diseases of humans, uh, their biology will be uh, clarified as we get to individual specific examples. But first, let's find out who they are. So we have a phylum uh, where all of the worms are located, except for the annelids. These, this phylum is called platyhelminthes, and it includes a lot of free-living organisms as well as the cestodes and the trematodes. So underneath phylum, of course, we have class trematoda. Now, it, in the old days, before DNA technology took over, we went on morphology and life cycle work. And we had two groups of trematodes. We had one group called the monogenean trematodes and another group called the diagenean trematodes. The monogenean trematodes infected fish, amphibians, and reptiles, whereas the diagenean trematodes infected cold-blooded and warm-blooded vertebrates. Since we have the advantage now of DNA technology on our side to tell us uh, more about the who's related to who aspect of life, we now find, indeed, that uh, the monogeneans were actually closer related to the cestodes than they were to the trematodes. So we're not going to even talk about them now. There is another class, however, that has been included underneath class trematoda, the subclass Aspidogastria. And this subclass includes non-medically important trematodes. They all have direct life cycles. That is to say, they don't involve any intermediate hosts. And we're not going to consider those because they're not important to us. However, the subclass Digenea contains around 6,000 species of trematode infections of cold and warm-blooded vertebrates. Now, most of those, fortunately, don't infect humans, but the ones that do uh, take its toll on the way we carry out our daily lives throughout the world. And as we'll see, some of them are, are quite serious diseases indeed. There are two kinds of Digenean trematodes. Most of them are monoecious as the term implies, they are um, organisms that contain both sex cells, both sex organs, and they can self-fertilize in some cases. And then there are the dioecious version of digenean trematodes, and in that case, the sexes are separate. And we'll see uh, with uh, the schistosomes that that is indeed the case. So trematode pathogens have complex life cycles. And the adult worms uh, take up life in various organs. Um, let's just talk about the human host for the, for the sake of argument here. And we have a liver fluke that obviously will live in the liver. We have a lung fluke, a paragonimus that seeks out the lung tissue and, and sets up home there, so to speak. We have the schistosomes, which live in the bloodstream. We have flukes, as they're called also. Um, and one of them uh, lives within the bile duct and feeds on epithelium. And we have others that sit in the small intestine, and they too feed on epithelial tissues. As I mentioned, their life cycles are complicated. They involve an egg, and that's typical for nematodes, trematodes, and cestodes. But in this case, the egg hatches in fresh water, typically. It releases a swimming stage which has a way of locating its intermediate host by chemical attractants. It seeks out these specific snail species, penetrates the snail, undergoes a complex uh, rearrangement of its tissues inside the snail to eventually produce a stage that penetrates out of the snail and also is free-living. So it has two free-living stages and a parasitic stage. This stage that swims is called the saccharia. In many species, the saccharia goes on to insist on its definitive host, or I'm, I'm sorry, on a peritonic host. A peritonic host is a host that simply acts as a carrier from one locale to another. And in this case, they happen to be fish. Let's just use those as an example here. So the saccharia, in, in some cases, can insist underneath the scales of freshwater fish. We then encounter these fish as part of our food chain, 
And by ingesting them raw or undercooked, we could encounter this uh, metasaccharial stage, which then, after being swallowed, could develop into several of the examples shown above and completing the life cycles. But again, as we uh, talk about them in specific, uh, we'll clarify which stages of those infections are common to that species. So I won't say any more about the biology because, uh, as I said, the, the, the biologies are, are extremely complex and, and form subjects on their own. So their metabolism, uh, the way in which they uh, uh, detect their environment, because they have a nervous system that allows them to do that. They have gut tracts. Some of them have complete gut tracts. Some of them don't. They um, carry out their lives in a variety of situations, which uh, allows them to occupy most of the ecological freshwater niches throughout the world. And so we have uh, two articles that uh, I've identified for you that you might want to learn more about the systemics and why we now no longer consider the monogeneans as part of this group. And we've also do, do, devoted at least one TWIP episode, to number 27, in, that you can access at microbe.tv slash TWIP, in which we've discussed trematode infections as well. So the next time, we'll start a discussion of the schistosomes, a very important group of trematodes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>